Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about equalization, and all the things around how to kind of shape and mold our audio. So stay tuned for that. If you've got questions about equalization, um, audio, audio equalization, go ahead and throw those into Makana and you can ask general questions in the first hour. And you can also use uh, this little QR code here. Um, this, this QR code, uh, it is askofficehours.com. You can just type that in as well. So uh, go ahead and uh, throw those questions in and let's go ahead and get started. Mitch, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. Uh, first question in from Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. Is there a speech intelligibility meter other than Steinberg Nuendo? I wish that Zoom had such a function to warn presenters of poor audio. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I, it's pretty cool. Um, if you check the link there, well, we'll, we'll show you the link later. But um, Fraunhofer, which is uh, the inventors of many things, including the MP3, I won't hold it against them, um, have designed a uh, device that shows this little cool display that moves uh, up and down on a uh, on a scale. So I would say that the uh, the Fraunhofer uh, 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 version of it does an interesting job because it's it's much more you know uh, hard to put your thumb on a specific number. It's uh, it's it's being weighing. What is it? Uh, they say it's not. It's subjective. That's the word I'm trying to think of. Subjective uh, quality uh, gives you a, a cool readout. So I'd say, yeah, there are, and it's cool. Go, Jeff. So historically, uh, intelligibility metering has been something that's been done acoustically. So a microphone into a device that it gives you a readout because they're worried about intelligibility in spaces. And I think it's now that we're doing so many uh digital meetings where that's important. Uh, the other one that I can think of, I believe Isotope Insight metering has an intelligibility uh, scale in there. So that's another plug-in that will do it in the digital domain. Yeah, I think that there's actually, I, it would be really great to have this in Zoom. And I, I think that it wouldn't, you can either, we can either put requests in for Zoom to look at it. Um, but also um, I think as an app, as a Zoom app, um, I think that you would be able to um, do that because you'd be able to take the audio and you're looking for obviously your uh, intelligibility is one thing I would really like to have it be quality <laughs> like so what is the dynamic range are is there breakup in the signal is there you know there's a lot of things there that that could be measured and I think that you could do that I know that some of it's subjective but I, I think some of it could be objective too I mean you could you could have it file within specific ranges to tell you a lot go ahead Mitchell As some of the uh, uh, specifications on the uh, the front offer device is it can tell when you're mumbling. That's a cool, cool feature. I don't know how they figured that out. Next question. Next question coming in to lot like Lopez Waterman. And I'm so sorry. If any panelist has gone through getting a repair done on a Blackmagic product, please tell us the process. Are there repair shops? Should I send it to Blackmagic Design? Loose power port on my ATEM Mini Pro. Good, Robert. Uh, yeah, I've had, uh, their little eight inch monitors I've needed repair on before. And I've, I've always gone directly through black magic and I, I gotta say they've been absolutely fantastic on it. Uh, they're very communicative. Uh, they'll, they'll be in touch with you relatively quick. I, I'd love to say, but I, I could probably say this about any repair. I'd love to say it's inexpensive. Uh, it typically is not, uh, if it's out of warranty, but, uh, I've had really good response getting it directly from black magic. Jason. Call them. They will do an excellent job. It, it's really that simple. Uh, if you're in warranty, it, you almost always are are going to get a um, a return air bill. Or I'm trying to remember if I had to pay for shipping. I, I think I did have to pay for shipping, but um, at one point, actually, I, I said, "Look, I've got a production. Like, I need this quick." And they took down the credit card to make sure that I was going to return it and, and actually sent me a new one in, in advance. Now, I think that's optional. I think that's up to them. But, um, you know, that, it, fantastic support. Jeffrey? Yeah, I had a video monitor that the uh, SD card died on it. So I called them up and it was out of warranty. So they said, yeah, th th I'd have to pay for shipping. 
but I sent it to them because they, you know, they said if they'd find if they could find an easy way to fix it, they they would. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't. I ended up uh, recycling the item and not getting it repaired because, of course, that would cost way too much for there. But when it comes to something like a uh, loose power port, I would try and see if there's anybody local that does do uh, black magic repair from there. Uh, but definitely call them and get all your options weighed. Courtney. Yeah, I'm kind of a do-it-yourself guy. So unless it's under warranty, I try and repair it myself or I'd find a local repair shop that's willing to tackle it. And A10 Mini Pro is a $300 product, you know, so shipping back and forth, if it has to go to Australia and back, that's going to be kind of pricey for that repair. Uh, and a, a, a loose power port is a pretty simple fix. Usually you can just resolder it back to the, to the motherboard and tighten it back up. Or if possible, maybe run a little jumper wire. But... A local uh, electronic repair shop should be able to handle it uh, for yeah. you pretty well. And I believe that the repairs are actually done in California and in, in Redwood City. Um, so that you know, for the for the U.S., so it's it's not it doesn't have to go very far. I do think you'll probably find that the cost of fixing that will be very close to the cost of buying a new one um, as you as you go down that path. It's just it just it's just time to pull things apart. So I, I agree with Courtney, especially with a power supply problem. Um, I'd be really tempted to open that up and resolder it. I bet you it's just a loose connection. Next question. Next question is from Jeff Cohen, and Jeff asks, uh, so sorry, uh, how does the current Fairlight and DaVinci Resolve stack up as a full-fledged DAW for dialogue editing? On paper, I'm blown away with everything it does and comes with. Go ahead, Jeff. Certainly when I'm working in DaVinci and I need to do a quick audio fix to something, it does have a lot of capability. Uh, is it going to replace Pro Tools for me? No, it, no, it's not. So when I want to get really deep into audio, um, especially uh, some uh, precise uh, crossfades, um, I just, uh, and maybe it's just, you know, decades of experience uh, with one DAW that makes me resistant to move into that, another DAW. So if I get, you know, a decade of experience with the the Fairlight DAW in Resolve, maybe I'd have a different answer. Um, it's certainly great. It's got a lot of features. You can do things quickly if you're doing something fairly simple. But if I'm going to do intense audio, I'm going to move and use a second system outside of Resolve. Yeah, I think the real power of Fairlight is is the mixture of having the editing package and the and the audio package in the same place at the same time. Um, obviously, there's a very tight connection between the um, the Avid video product and the and the and Pro Tools, uh, but they, but I think that there's something also about having it in the same app. I know when I'm doing complex um, Atmos or or and HDR, oftentimes at the same time, Vision and Atmos, um, I need to do it in Resolve, <laughs> like just because trying to keep all of that stuff together has been there, even in those cases. We have done the final edit and the final build in Pro Tools later. So we export it out of out of um, Resolve, send it to, send it to an engineer that's going to finish it in Pro Tools. Mickey is <laughs> in the background and have him finish it all up. But but we um, we typically so we have not fully moved over to Fairlight. We're still I mean I I use it for my personal projects, but on the larger scale projects with um, especially with a lot of channels and a really complex thing is still going to Pro Tools. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, remember Fairlight has been around. They were a pioneer in digital recording and editing uh, from the early days, and but long before Blackmagic acquired them, they had uh, turnkey systems uh, that were for uh, tracking, recording, digitizing, and editing dialogue for radio spots and everything else. So I think their editing tools should be pretty darn good. They may not integrate, as was said said earlier, with. Uh, uh, Avid very well, but because they always had their own kind of system. But I think uh, Resolve has done a pretty good job of incorporating it, tying it into the editor in Resolve. Uh, so you should be really good. The tools are actually pretty good for editing dialogue. Next question. Eric Hers from Hartford, Connecticut asking, if you're already using Dante Audio, why not use Dante AV Ultra for video distribution as well? Guy? Yeah, it's a little more complicated than that. The uh, the encoders are about two grand, so there's only a handful of folks that have them. When the, these first hit the scene, Bolin was the first uh, to market with a camera and a, and a decoder slash encoder, an HDSDI version. Two grand. I mean, it's expensive, and it is uh, basically a, with ultra point to point, so it's not multicast. You're not throwing stuff around and being able to to like NDI pick it up in multiple places. So you want to be really careful about uh, implementing. Uh, uh, Dante AV Ultra. Now there is a lower bandwidth version, which is uh, starting to get popular and there is Dante Studio. So if you, if, 
it's about 25 bucks a year to download Dante Studio. So if you want to bring this into something like vMix, you're going to have to put Dante Studio on. And basically that turns your, your beautiful uh, uncompressed footage or lightly compressed footage into a webcam. So it, it's a little more complicated. You want to do your research before implementing uh, Dante V Ultra. I'd probably stick with NDI for now. Nigel? Yes, and the other thing about Dante Studio is it only runs on PC, so for the Mac people in our world, this is not a thing for us. I think the other point I'd make is the one that a guy just said so well. It's the entry point. You know, if there was a Dante Avio type device that would allow me to connect video, that might be an interesting thing to start using. But the step up is so high that we're not just suddenly going to play with it. Jeff? It's, uh, it's too new. Let everyone else... Uh fall over themselves testing this before I start trying to use it in a production. Let it be tested first. John. I mean, it's oh go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Go, go ahead and finish. No, go ahead, John. Okay, good, John. There's three flavors of Dante A V. So there's there's the Ultra, there's A, and then there's H. H is H264. That's the one that PTZ Optics is integrated in. Like Nigel said, Dante Studio only runs on a PC, which is kind of a bummer. Now just remember this Dante Ultra is 700 megs for one for one stream and so it's super bandwidth intensive uses motion jpeg it uses uh mpeg 2000 just like the bottom flavor of 2110 does so consideration next question philip oler from catonia new york um in my opinion major corporations looking for best setup for home studio Camera with option to follow teleprompter lights must be turnkey. Any suggestions? Greatly appreciated. Nigel? Yes, I actually read that as CMO, which is Chief Marketing Officer, rather than, in my opinion, so as a, a Chief Marketing Officer, here's my advice. It depends. Uh, I, think, I think there are two different questions you have to ask yourself. Is Are they trying to look better on Zoom, or are they trying to do, you know, embeds into broadcast television? Because if they're trying to look, uh, better on Zoom, which is great, and I would encourage all execs to do likewise. And you want it turnkey, you're going to have to make some compromises. And while it probably might not cut it for this show, I really like the Elgato product set. That they're, they're sort of good enough, and they all work with Stream Deck. So once set up, you can just hit the buttons on the Stream Deck, turn the lights on, turn the mic on, turn the camera on. So that's the really the lowest entry, sort of higher quality. You can move up to an Insta360, you can move up to a Shure MV7, you can do all of those things, satellites. But now you're starting to move away from a turnkey solution and the person's going to have to be much more involved. Now the question is, you said they want a teleprompter. Well, do they do they want to read from the teleprompter or do they want to do what mo most of us use is use it as something to be able to look into the camera lens in, uh, as, as a tool like that? That's next level complexity in there and now, and now if really they want a turnkey where they have to do nothing then the best thing to do probably would be buy a camera and put it just on top of the monitor and let them use the monitor so it really depends what they want to do it for and how turnkey it has to be one other thing to think about is, is whether you want remote control over it. So a lot of things when we build for C-suite, we're, we're looking at how can we control every item that's in there so that they don't have to, there, there's turnkey for them. And then there's just turnkey that you can, that turnkey for somebody else on the back end can set it up or, or fix it as they need it. So the things that we look for are uh, PTZs uh, and for, you know, for a CMO, I probably, you know, again, you didn't give us a price range, so I would be looking at the Sony FR7. Um, the, you know, with the with the I think it's the 35 to 128 um, is probably a pretty good setup. So you can make a lot of adjustments there um, to make that actually work. Um, look for DMX lighting so that you can have it um, tie back into a network so that you can control those lights. Um, and then think about some kind of uh, mixer that you're going to be able to control over a VPN. Um, so those are the kind of things you want to kind of think about so that you can tie that all together and you can control everything over IP. Um, and we, we've built a couple of those kits in there that we built them in the last generation. So we were using, I think, the Sony BR brc 1000s um but um but the but the next what we would use now is probably fr7 the ptz helps a lot if you're trying to do a remote control um i think that there's some really interesting things with what black magic's doing related to rest and we're going to talk about that tomorrow so rest commands into the camera um and a variety of things through bridge 
Um, so those things could be interesting for the camera, but the, you know, the autofocus makes a big difference for the Sonys um, and the ability to make minor adjustments to framing as someone sits down and, and wants to show something is a big deal. And so we hope to see um, other cam more cameras follow the FR7 where we have a full frame sensor and the ability to autofocus and control zoom. Next question. Talalik Lopez Waterman from Phoenix, Arizona. What is used on MacBreak Weekly to have such a steady scroll rate on shared websites? I go ahead, Courtney. Well, Alex may know better than that. I'm I'm kind of guessing, but Leo a lot of times shares those websites out of his Linux computer. And a lot of things people don't realize is you can smooth scroll if you click a scroll wheel and just move the mouse down. You can do a really a smooth, steady scroll. And it's what they probably use for doing the commercials where he's scrolling down through the advertiser's website. Uh, or maybe something on the TriCaster has the same way of doing that. That's one way of doing it. Yeah, uh, the... Uh, they may be doing it for the ads. Um, they may be doing something a little bit different, and I don't know. So we'll, we'll, I'll reach out to them and find out what they're actually using for this. So it could be exactly what Courtney's talking about, a smooth scroll. I know what I do is I usually capture the entire page that I'm trying to show. I piece it back together into one long file, and then I animate it in either motion or After Effects. <laughs> so, so for an ad, um, you know, we would just, an, you know, we just cut to it and it's just going up very slowly. So if it's during the live show, it's probably some kind of smooth scroll. If it's during the commercial, I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing that in post. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to, um, to make that actually work. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if you're uh, uh, doing a scroll, in, sorry about the leaf blower, a scroll inside of After Effects, um, I use expressions because otherwise you might get a little bit of jitter going on. Good, Bill. Yeah, I do exactly the same thing Alex does. Bring in a large uh, capture of the entire web page and then use the tools inside your NLE. It, it's a much smoother experience. You can have ease in and ease out and really make it look great. Yeah, and when, we, when I do a lot of them where we want to show something on a web page and you want it to scroll up kind of fast and then stop and then scroll up, but you want the ease in and ease out. And the way that I do those are if you think about the F curve, either in After Effects or you, you have it like you basically go like this and you have another, another set of teeter bars here. And then you, you'd keep on going like this in that, and you do it, I do it in the F curve so I can see them rather than using standard ease in and ease out. And I have a lot more control of how fast they, they go in and out. Um, you can do more fine tuning. The ease in and ease out works well when you get started as you get, when you want a more advanced feel, um, then opening up the F curves and again, in either motion or after effects will do the job. Go ahead, Jason. I use an app for iOS called Taylor that allows me to, you know, segment and screen capture, and then it will stitch the screen caps together seamlessly and, you know, get rid of that little bar on the bottom of the iPhone or iPad. And then from there, um, yeah, either After Effects or, or Final Cut. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael, we talk about gear acquisition syndrome, or GAS, in relation to hardware purchases, but have you ever struggled with the same issue in relation to software? Robert? Well, I mean, part of the reason we got into this business is gear acquisition syndrome, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, that's what... I had it before I got in the business. So. Uh, but <laughs> to, to answer the question, I would say, yeah, absolutely, it's a problem with software because... Typically, software processors are way cheaper than analog processors, and we just collect them like bad pennies, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think we all suffer from it a little bit. <laughs> go ahead, Jeff. Although yeah, I, and the... Uh, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to smirkily add, although software takes up way less warehouse space. So, you know, that's <laughs> that part of it's, you know, appetizing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, software takes up less space, but sometimes you forget you have it and you buy things twice or uh, you get those Black Friday or special <laughs> special sale deals where like, you know, $19 this week and, and it gets you one of a plug in and then you're like, oh, I need the whole kit. And then they get you with the upgrade the next year or, uh, you know, for those people who know Waves, you get whooped. Uh, the Waves upgrade plan. Uh, so, yeah, software gas is a problem. Bill. If for no other reason, just open your iPhone and count the number of apps you had. I did it right before the show because I was thinking about this question, and I think I have 240 apps. Probably 100 of them are actually useful anymore. But you just keep loading this stuff, and because it sits there quietly and you don't really notice it's there, particularly if you put it in groups, that it just keeps growing. 
<laughs> 200 apps you're just getting started bill you're yeah, just getting started you know this, this can get the, the water can get so much deeper let me tell you when especially when you, re, you review them for a show you end up one of the, the rules that i make with uh, my phone my new phone is on its way i just got my email this morning um the one of the things i do with the phone is i do not um i do not copy from one uh phone to another so i you know they're all in my iCloud and you know and in, in connected to my phone so as i need them i just put them back on but i don't put them back on automatically or i don't rebuild the phone automatically i let it just kind of build back up again and that helps me kind of filter out the ones that that i you know each year it kind of slowly filters out the other bits and pieces go ahead courtney uh, yeah, I have it more with hardware than with software because the thing about hardware, you know, because I'm always interested in a new piece of hardware, I'll buy it and try it out, but I can always resell it. You can't do that with the software. I do have a lot of uh, apps on my phone, but uh, as far as expensive productivity software that, you know, is a one time purchase of seven or eight hundred dollars, I wait long and hard before I plunk down my money for something like that because it's got to work. And if it doesn't work, you can't take it back or sell it to somebody else, you know. Nigel? When you go to the supermarket, just before you check out, there's all those things that are designed to create a thing called impulse purchases. I would like to say that office hours is an impulse purchase environment because <laughs> we what someone answers a question. It happened the other day. Oh, I could browse HDMI on my, oh, it's only $7. Half the things on my iPad, I suspect, are impulse purchase I've done because somebody mentioned it and I probably never go back to it. Good, Jeffrey. So I used to hold a spreadsheet, and but that got really difficult to remember to actually fill out the spreadsheet every time I get a new subscription. Everything comes with a license and email, so what I would do is I would take the email and I'd uh, actually put a uh, flag on it uh, going into a specific category so I could go right into a folder, see all of my subscriptions from there. I also been doing the trick that uh, you, Alex, uh, talked about, and that's basically uh, if it's a subscription, then to subscribe and then just instantly cancel the uh, recurring payment. And then that way, when it comes up, you're at least uh, you're at least at, at that point where you can say, do I need it? Do I not need it? And get rid of it from, from there. I have to admit that I'm very resistant. There's only a few memberships that I'll pay for uh, outside of the Apple ecosystem because I can manage all of my subscriptions. And I just feel like if I get a subscription outside of the ecosystem, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know when I'm going to, you know, I'll forget about it. It's going to go there. So I have to kind of keep paying attention to those things. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I've found the easiest way to keep my um, software acquisition at at bay is just to continue to buy new computers. That, that, that solves all my problems. <laughs> Next question. Jeffrey Reyes from Bronx, New York. I'm getting started in 3D. If given the choice of learning Blender or Cinema 4D, which would be the better choice? Money isn't a problem as I can get the student rate for Cinema 4D. By the way, my son has the student rate for Cinema 4D. It's like $10 a year. So if you're a student, you know, this is the way to go. Uh, I, you know, again, there's Blender has got a lot of tools that are really great uh, for something that's free. The I think that the opera the the scalability and what you can do with it the ecosystem the training everything else that's related to um, building something out Cinema 4D really owns that market um, and they do it better than almost anybody else and so I would really recommend Cinema 4D if if cost is not an issue if cost is an issue Blender is a great place to get started um, you know we see a lot of people play with it and you see a lot of stuff on online I don't know many large scale productions that incorporate blender you know other than little bits and pieces here and there so it's a good cost effective way to get into 3d but if i if if you're not dealing with money if you're a student um, i would highly recommend both cinema 40 and then really utilizing cineversity which is their community that um, really helps move everybody forward my, my son's going through that training right now um, and i've used cineversity for for years um, next question from alton christensen and uh, the question is, why don't broadcasters and others make more of an effort to post correct remote interview audio? Original live hits can be treated before and after uh, with the BBC, for example. Adobe and others would make these news clips less annoying. Good, Jeff. I think it comes down to one simple word, and that's care. They don't care to apply the amount of... Uh, money, time, whatever they need to, to take care of these afterwards because they were fine when they went up live. So they're fine now and fine just kills everything. Yeah. Good enough is the enemy of great or humanity. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. 
you know, the problem is most of these things are news related and news related stuff has a half life of about three hours these days. So it's not worth it to go back and fix it unless it's a clip that's going into a retrospective or something. And then you can spend the time and the money on cleaning it up. But uh, news, news hits, you know, after they've aired the first time, they're no longer really worth anything to them. So they don't want to spend the money on them to try and clean them up. And plus, half the time, they don't know where it goes down the pipeline after the live air. You know, it may be packaged for streaming. It may be going out to, you know, affiliates, uh, packages, who knows. And so uh, they kind of lose control of it after it once it airs. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I've actually worked in newsrooms, and I think Courtney is exactly right. It, it is a fire hose of information coming in from a hundred different sources, and then the news directors and the other people in management are trying to filter out and figure out what's most important for their audience. And the, that half life is incredibly short. It's just too much data coming in to look at each piece of it, even the pieces that go to air, and try to perfect them. Robert, sorry there. You know, I was just going to throw an alternate perspective in here that, you know, I, I was talking to some broadcast people at one point and they were talking about news. And, you know, say the, the mindset was, well, this is not just news. This is actually history that we're capturing here. Right. And, you know, with that kind of thought in mind, what we're actually going to see over the past 10 or 12 years is a historical record of how bad audio got for a period of time. You know, especially with things like Zoom and stuff, you know, contributing to the news cycle, et cetera. Man, I mean, it was bad. And it's and it hasn't gotten a whole lot better. You know, I mean, it's it's pretty tough. So it's going to be a nice historical record of it. That's for sure. Yeah, I think that, you know, when we first started doing broadcast and we were sending out Skype, you know, Skype kits and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, uh, you know, but we sent those out and and um it really is the mic, you know, it's not the the platform, you know, most of the, the audio quality, if you listen to this show, it's better than most broadcasts. Most broadcasts is actually not that good. If you listen to uh, like take uh, George, you know, this week with George Stephanopoulos and just close your eyes and listen to how much you can hear the studio and everything else, it's all there most of the time. It's just that we don't notice it as much. But when we send this out and we, we've prepped probably, um, you know, my team has probably prepped 6,000 people in the last, you know, 10 years, you know, for virtual events. And uh, the big thing that you find is that, you know, when you send them out to, you know, consumers or you know, to the uh, civilians, the problem really is, is that you end up with, you know, you can't control their space. You can't control how far away they are from the mic. You can't control the mics. And so we built lots and lots of kits for that um, so that we can try to, you know, um, handle that. Then you have people, they have producers that don't want the mics in the shot, but, you know, labs won't, you know, the, the physics problem with labs of getting too far away in a, in a very noisy room um, becomes more problematic. So there's just a lot of things. And again, the broadcasters, you know, this is, they're just pushing through it. They're just, you know, they've got 20 of these today and, th and they're going to do the best they can with each one of them. The, um, one of the problems that we have also, I've been dealing with some folks on the other side that are trying to do the best they can. So they've got great mics, they've got great cameras. When it comes in over Zoom, the broadcasters, the networks just jam it. So they send it into an EQ, we were talking about EQ, but they send an EQ that just folds everything in, compresses it. And so it sounds bad, even if they brought in a good mic. Um, because they just want it to be okay. You know, they just want to just put it in a little box that just says all things from Zoom go through here, whether you have a good mic or not. So what they have to do is you have to get on something like LTN or the switch so that you're coming from a network connection that they expect to be good or it's going to sound bad no matter what. Even if you have a good mic going into broadcast, a lot of times it's not going to work because it's going to get shaved into the little box that they want to keep it in so that everybody works pretty well. Go ahead, Robert. I, I was just going to add, you know, I'm, I, as you can kind of tell, I'm kind of fascinated by this period of history and stuff, you know, with yeah. the, you know, with COVID lockdown and everything. I, the other thing that I that is loosely related to this that I thought was really interesting was watching, you know, artists trying to survive during that period and pulling together, you know, we're going to broadcast our music live from our home and, you know, whatever during this period. And it was really revealing, like. You know, I thought it revealed the home studio challenge in a nutshell, where you have somebody who puts up a really good mic in a really bad sounding living room and you just go, OK, now we know why we need two thousand dollar a day studios. You know, if it's not evident to you there, it should be, you know, and why we need producers and why we need good recording engineers to make music sound the way it does. It's not just throwing up a mic in a room and start playing, you know. 
Yeah. And, and finding the right mic for the right room too. I mean, you look at the, you know, like I have this kind of larger diaphragm mic and I have moving blankets all the way apart, all, all what you can't see <laughs> because otherwise the mic is completely unusable. You know, in this space, I'd have to go back to something that's a, um, you know, much more off axis rejection. You were gonna say something else, Robert. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that. You know, it was the interesting thing for the home studio movement, you know, and everybody th kept thinking, well, if I get a better sounding mic, my bedroom will sound better. And it's like, no, the better sounding mic is just gonna reveal all the problems in your room. So, you know, it, it was just an interesting psychology to watch over a period of a couple of decades there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Chris Sabato from Albany, Oregon has a question. I use diagrams.net to map production IO. Images of the devices help me conceptualize the IO of the equipment I'm using. Is there an iPad app that would allow me to easily make these on the go? Jason. I haven't used an iPad app for this, but friend of the show, John Barker, has this incredible website, uh, H2R Gear, that they can do exactly what you're saying without uh, the pretty pictures. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, HTR Gear is a great place to look at. It should work fine on your iPad. The, the, the other one that we use often is OmniGraffle, um, which has both an iPad app as well as a Mac OS app. Next question. John Prado, Las Vegas, USA, asking, Mac OS Sonoma dropped yesterday. What are your first thoughts? Nigel? That it works on all my machines without blowing them up. That was my first thought. I mean, I, I'd been running the beta on uh, on one machine, and there were a couple of products, uh, the Ordinate stuff, so that has to work, and uh, the Rogue Amoeba stuff has to work. So I'm I'm watching those things first, particularly Rogue Amoeba can drag their, their heels, but they're actually uh, all seem to be working. When that's working, I move to my next machine, which is sort of my day-to-day -day machine. Uh, and when that's working, I... Uh, I move to the one that actually sends stuff out. And uh, they've all moved pretty quickly, uh, no real problems. I don't know there's a lot of new features here. There are some bits and bobs that people are getting excited about. But mostly, uh, I think they've been working on the on the back side of it, the code cleaning up, speeding up, uh, and it, it seems to work fine. I think you're going to see apps as... as more app developers accept Apple's abstractions from the code um, so that they're using the libraries that Apple gives them, you'll find that their updates go a lot faster. Um, they're going to have any any app that is trying to do it on the, on their own and not using Apple's infrastructure um, is going to always have a hard time <laughs> because Apple's moving very fast and they've warned everybody that they have to follow along. And if they don't, then they're just going to, they're going to keep moving without, without them. So that's going to be a, a challenge for companies that have much more dense uh, code infrastructure that doesn't, that especially stuff that's trying to be cross-platform. Go ahead, John. You know, out of the last 10 upgrades of all the California places, and it says it's got a hundred new features. I, I don't notice maybe one or two <laughs> new features, but the cool new feature of this one is the animation and the wallpaper that comes in where you fly <laughs> over. like having an animated the wallpaper. Sonoma. They lowered the log into the bottom and they have this beautiful uh, vista of the of the wine fields in Sonoma. It's awesome. You go, Jason. Uh, it's on one of my three production Mac minis. And so far it, Pretty cool. Um, app integration, especially shortcut integration, is really great. So, you know, if you have an app in the foreground and then you click away, all your widgets kind of wake up and and um, all the apps just kind of pull away. Um, it's stable. I upgraded to or yeah, yesterday and it's it's running meters beautifully. So, um, yeah, no complaints, Chris. You know, John, my first thoughts are you're way too old to use the phrase dropped. It dropped yesterday. So please refrain from that. That's crazy. Um, uh, Nigel, I had not thought of um, Rogue Amoeba, but now that I think about it, um, I'm on Sonoma right now. That's the machine I'm using. Uh, about two days ago, Rogue Amoeba had an update and I had to update that. So maybe they were actually ahead of the game. So that was working. The one thing I'm interested in, though, I don't know what the, what they call this little thing. This thing popped up in my menu bar, and you click on it, and it's 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 almost like a mini app switcher. So I'm not sure what they call it. And oh, some is that the of screen the screen share. Ah, uh, maybe the that's what it is. Yeah. So it's the coolest thing that I think. It's the one thing that has me really wanting to go to Sonoma. Is we talked about this a little bit on Mac Break yesterday. Um, it is a, it is, it basically can be the camera. You can basically have Apple be the camera for Zoom or whatever, and then you have actual control of switching between screens and yourself and a lot of other things. 
that are all, you know, fed to the, to whatever it is, you know, so Apple's taking, kind of takes over that control um, from that system. It's really, that's a pretty powerful um, system, know, but it's basically taking that away from the, from, so you don't have to figure out how to make it work in Teams and, and, and Meet and Zoom, Apple just lets you do it with them. So Alex, I understood all the words that you just said, but the combination of the way you put them together, I don't think I understood ex- what you're we'll, trying we'll to, to do a demo. say. I, I, I okay. actually, I've only, I, I, I know that we talked about it. I don't have it on there because I'm not going to upgrade and probably until February. Um, I find okay. that, uh, you know, Apple, I, Apple, the, the operating system settles somewhere in January or February when Apple starts to stop looking at the old one and starts looking at the new one. For right. probably, you know, the engineering changes, I think. I, that's my opinion. I don't know if that's true or not. But I think Apple, I think you see a lot less updates after January. And so that that leads me to believe that Apple is then paying attention to whatever the new thing is and they've yeah. left the old thing behind. It also gives everybody three or four months to get their software up to speed and, and everything else. And I, I find that there's no feature... There's rarely a feature that is worth upgrading for to destabilize my production machines. So I'll probably have a Mac mini or two that have it on it so I can kind of see what's happening, but I'm not gonna put it on any main machines for um, for quite some time. Uh, go yeah, what's interesting oh, is that, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry, what's interesting is that these ones that do involve the camera, like the Instalink and OBS, it's actually showing me what it's doing, but then some of them, it's like, yeah, yeah, you, you have another app going, but we're not using, right. we're not dealing with that. Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, if you're super tempted, I wouldn't be the voice of reason here. If you're on production machines, have an isolated other machine. Like I have one of these little Mac Mini M- M2s to play with. Uh, I got burned on this last time where I uh, immediately upgraded and it knocked my big, huge RAID array offline. And uh, I just got an email from our friends over at Melrose Mac. Same thing. It says uh, Mac OS Sonoma bug affecting Sonnet M.2 PCI users. So your your data will not be gone, it's telling you, but you'll have to back down. So be be aware, just be careful. Production machines, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> step, step very carefully there. Next question. Chris Sabato in Albany, New- Oregon. Uh, sure just released the SM7DB, an update to the classic with built-in preamp. Thoughts? Jeff? So brilliant name to take the SM7B and add a D before that to get a dB decibel boost. Uh, essentially, they've taken uh, the cloud lifter FET head idea of the phantom powered booster and put it into the mic. They've got uh, 18 dB or 28 dB boost. Uh, they do have a bypass, which hopefully makes the is a true uh, true wire bypass that doesn't require phantom power. I wasn't able to get the manual up to find out if that's true, uh, but I would hope that would be the case. Um, It's a great idea because it makes that mic, uh, you know, solves that problem for a lot of people that have a uh, low gain preamp. But the problem is you're stuck with their gain booster. You can't use this mic. Uh, Well, you could. You just have to pay an extra $100. And if you decide you don't like it, you you switch it off and use a fat head or use a a high gain preamp. Uh, Courtney. Yeah, everything that uh, he just said. Uh, It looks like the if in looking at the chart, on it, it says the sensitivity on the uh, the DB is has got three different sensitivities, so you may not have a continuously adjustable level on that. It may be you know A, B, or C, uh, and uh, so you can like turn it off necessarily, but it's going to require phantom power, unlike the other. I sure. Uh, just be thankful, you know, we're not going back to we're speaking of news and dynamic microphones, the old. RCA BK4. Look at that lavalier on Dave Garraway on the Today Show, huh? How would you like to have that strapped around your neck? You can put a 7B on that same outfit and use it for uh, live TV, huh? Why are we not doing that? That'd be it'd be at least a good a good YouTube segment. <laughs> Mitchell, it's nice to see a classic broadcast mic like the SN7B get updated to today with a bit of a preamp. Across the line of the mics we like to use from Sure, we always seem to have a little problem getting that extra dB or so out of it. It, it, it could that not be addressed in some kind of design issue with the I, uh, the mics in general? I addressed it. I just got a sound devices mix pre three. <laughs> like that's how you address that. And anyway, we go ahead, Robert. I I was just going to say, please don't bring it to your live show and plug it in. That's what I was just going to say. Please don't bring it. I, if you want to use it for your podcast and everything else, please don't bring it. 
and start adjusting it on stage. That's all I ask. <laughs> Exactly. You know, I'm not that excited about about um, having a studio mic that then goes through a relatively cheap preamp is not not my not something that I'd be super excited about. Go ahead, Jeff. To go back to Mitchell's question about can't you redesign the mic to give it more gain without having a, a preamp uh, amp, amplifier in there? Dynamic mics. It's based on the coil of wire. So you need to add more wire if you want more voltage, more sensitivity out of it, but that makes more mass. And this is already a large diaphragm that has a lot of mass and, and inertia is the enemy of, of microphones because they don't want to move. Uh, they would like to sit still and we need microphones to move when sound hits them, or you need to change the magnet to use a, a stronger magnet. Uh, neodymium magnets could be used in there. Um, but all of those things will, will change the sound of that mic. And so if they don't want to change the classic sound of the SM7B, you either need a really good preamp, a very loud source, or you need to amplify at the source as they're doing here with the booster. Go ahead, Robert. I was just going to add to that, you know, to that question about, can't they just make it with more gain? You know, it's important to remember the legacy of the SM7, right? It is essentially, from what I understand, an SM57 capsule with no backplane, right? It's just posted out on a big post out in front of the body now, and it's essentially the SM4, uh, SM57. So uh, I, I will say it, from a studio perspective, if you take an SM57 and you plug it into a Telefunken V70 pre right at the bottom of a mic stand, it's an unbelievable sound. I mean, it's an incredible vocal sound. Uh, but that said, it needs that preamp. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael, uh, what is the rapid, w with the rapid pace of change to Mac OS each year, what is your personal guideline for when to upgrade? Nigel. Yeah, I think we sort of answered this a few minutes ago. And, and uh, you know, the two pieces of advice that's probably worth reiterating is check the software that is most important to your life and make sure that it works uh, and other people know it works before moving. But secondly, if you're in the middle of a production, if you're in the middle of doing a job that is really important to you and really important to your business, don't change anything on it till that job is done. That there are, um, in the high-end computing world, examples that, uh, like plane manufacturers, will freeze a system for like 20 years because they can't afford for anything to change. So those are the two pieces of advice I think you have to work for yourself. When I was working on Star Wars, we... <laughs> We kept After Effects in the same version for years. And when we came out of it, it was like we finished Star Wars and we came out of it. We're like, look at all these tools we could have used in the show. But we couldn't couldn't afford to even have incompatibilities with, with previous project files. I go ahead, Bill. What everybody is saying, this isn't actually a software decision. This is a risk assessment decision. So how much risk you have determines whether or not you're going to be liberal or conservative with your upgrade policy. Go ahead, Jeff, real quick. Jeffrey? Depending, depending on the software, uh, the, the support on these things are just amazing nowadays. So if you've got, you can get into Discord groups, you can get into other forums, people that have been working with the beta software with a lot of these programs, just follow those and follow what they're saying, mm -hmm. because most of the time they're absolutely right. And then, then you can make your choice as to up, uh, when to upgrade now or later. Good, Chris. What, what I consider about upgrading is how far off the path do you run your machine? If you have a ton of accessories and uh, uh, devices attached to it that, that depend on a lot of software, it, you may be on a much more um, uh, tippy playing field. So you have to have that everything has to be balanced and actually working right. I tend to work pretty much down the middle using Apple's products the way Apple wants me to use them. And frankly, if I took the advice of, if you're in the middle of an important thing, don't upgrade, I'd be using software from 15 years ago because we are literally always in the middle of something. When one job ends, I'm already halfway through another one. So I have to do it. I just, and so I, I will probably put Sonoma on my main editor today. It's just, it, I have to. 
I'm always three to six months behind. <laughs> so I, there's nothing there's nothing there that I need need. I mean, there's things that are cool, but I don't need them. I, I'm very aggressive about my phone and my iPad. I, I I'm on beta on that and upgrade it all the time. You know, my in my watch because they're just not they're not part of my production pipeline. Um, quick reminder that you can ask uh, questions throughout the hour. Um, so go ahead and throw those questions into Makana, or you can use the QR code as well, um, and uh, or askofficehours.com. So go ahead and uh, ask those questions there. Of course, if you want the second hour questions, I'd recommend using Makana for that. And make sure to vote on the questions. We've got a lot of questions today. Um, so make sure to vote on the questions so we know what order you'd like us to answer them in. Next question. Jack Rupel from Breckenridge, Colorado asks, got an iPhone 15 Pro Max to replace an iPhone XR. It overheats on YouTube app, thinking about reactivating XR as the phone and using the Pro Max as a camera with LiDAR only. What are your thoughts? Good, Chris. Uh, Jack, first of all, you may want to pick up one of these little guys, which you know all about. Uh, to check the heat. Uh, we actually use this on a camping trip. Also, I just saw something this morning that said running Instagram, even if you're not using Instagram, could possibly cause a heating problem. Uh, I, I realize you're on Instagram 24-7, but uh, give it, at least try it. Turn it off for two days and see if it still overheats. Uh, t- turn off all, uh, uninstall, not turn off, but uninstall all the meta apps and just see how your battery runs. <laughs> You'll be amazed. Good, Bill. Yeah, there's another thing I've read recently, which is that uh, with this new upgrade and the new phones, there's a ton of indexing that has to go on when you first boot the phone. And I've heard a lot, I've read uh, quite a few reports of people saying it was two or three days when in the background my phone was sluggish, it was overheating, it was getting all sorts of problems because of this huge indexing event, but that it eventually, after two or three days, went right back to normal and everything was good. So just pay attention to that. Maybe uh, look up iPhone indexing and see if you can read through some of that and get some good valuable information. Jason? Bill's exactly right. Um, I actually log the process as part of of my upgrades. And yes, there is a lot of indexing that happens right after the fact. It also, a lot of it happens when the phone is first plugged in post upgrade and connected to its primary significant location, Wi-Fi. And then the final part of that is turn off background app refresh for every single app that you that you don't want to be able to wake up the phone. And yeah, uh, Meta's the worst. Next question. Eric Hers in Hartford, Connecticut. How will restoring net neutrality rules affect Netflix advantage over smaller streamers? Good, Nigel. Yeah, I'm concerned that the move to net neutrality, um, and it's Typically the opposite of what it's named. And by the way, if you ever want to understand acts of parliament or government, you should take the name and go the opposite way. Um, I'm very concerned that I think net neutrality is being driven by a large amount of uh, investors in uh, or influencers from high-end companies, and it's going to squeeze out uh, the small uh, users here. And I think that while it sounds great in principle, what's going to happen is they're going to overwhelm the ISPs, and we're going to find that the sort of free market economy that we've been operating is going to disappear. I suspect this is a political football that's going to go backwards and forwards for a few years until uh, bandwidth becomes so available, and we're getting there, that some of this is a redundant debate. Courtney? Yeah, net neutrality was was the idea that, you know, the uh, ISPs were double dipping. They were charging you for downloading data, and they were charging the people like Netflix and YouTube for uploading, you know, sending the data to you. So they were getting paid on both sides of that one view. Uh, So net neutrality then said that they couldn't get a discount. Uh, You know, Netflix and and, uh, YouTube and the larger streamers wouldn't be able to get uh, their upload speed at a, a, you could get a discount for upload speed, but net neutrality means everybody pays the same thing. So it may mean that small streamers may be pushed out a lot, but these days small streamers can just upload to a uh, to to a server of some sort like Vimeo or YouTube and let YouTube pay the big uh, you know uh, host the thing and pay the big big bucks for the streaming costs. So. I don't think it's going to change much. Netflix used to be number one consumer of bandwidth on the internet. I think YouTube has overtaken them now. Jason? I have a lot of strong opinions about net neutrality. Uh, for me, as far as ISPs are concerned, 
it's it's really a matter of making them Title II common carriers or utilities in, in essence. Um, that to me matters more than net neutrality by itself. Uh, within the scope of the question though, um, it affects Netflix's cost, which means that they can be spending money on other things other than delivery and bandwidth. It, 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 it um, the, the, for small streamers, we're gone. <laughs> like, like, like that, like that, that, that ship has sailed. So, so the, you know, they, you have to, you have to fit into some kind of CDN infrastructure because of peering agreements and so on and so forth that are within the whole system that are much more complex than what's being conver- talked about in this, in this uh, area. But you have to go through uh, a CDN infrastructure, whether it's AWS or, or, or Azure or other things that are there. Um, because the way that the infrastructure is set up for the CDNs, you're not competitive um, pretty much any other way at scale. You know, you can do it in small amounts. And when I say small amounts, less than a million viewers or something like that. But once you start going over that, uh, you, you need to have, you need to go through some of this larger infrastructure that gets pretty expensive. Um, next question. Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand asking, we used to use physical film in cameras and the camera motors determined the frame rate, right? In the digital age, what determines frame rate, the delivery pipeline or the consumer or both? I'll go according. Uh, usually it's the acquisition uh, device determines the acquisition frame rate, and that's usually determined by a microprocessor that is running a clock and a crystal control clock usually at that. And, you know, film cameras did move from... Uh, uh, just free-running electric motors to crystal-controlled electric motors. And that's where they got uh, uh, where you could uh, record sound and uh, f- film separately and keep them in sync because you'd have a crystal motor on both of those devices. So these days, it's uh, it's derived from the processor's clock, usually. And although that processor clock is not in usually in a temperature-controlled situation its accuracy isn't as good as some of the temperature-controlled oscillators that are in crystal-controlled cameras and so on. Yeah, lost my page. There we go. Um, uh, Next question. Vincent Alvarez from Bellingham, Washington. Far away, co-workers need to record an interview in a loud coffee shop with one person later to be transcribed. As using a Zoom microphone, H2N, never touched one myself. Which of the four pickup patterns should they use? Jeff? So this uh, Zoom H2N has five microphones on it. Uh, and so it shows that there are several different uh, patterns you can pick. What I would choose is the one that says MS. Now, they're doing a little bit strange thing with MS. MS is mid-side mic technique. So there's definitely a mic facing forward right there with that MS arrow. Instead of using a bi-directional facing sideways, they have actually two mics that they combine together to make that S. So I would record in MS and then I would sum it to mono or if you give the ability to turn the S component all the way down to make this as uh, mono as possible and that will cancel out those two side mics so you just have the forward facing microphone. So you're basically using that's the way to make this device give you one microphone that points directly in front. And that's the one I would use. That's going to get you uh, the least possible other sounds besides the one person that you're interviewing. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I totally agree on that. Plus, the, the, the bigger problem is we don't know if this is audio or video that, that's being recorded. With audio, you can take a lot of liberties, like get that microphone as, as close to the person's voice as possible. If there are two people, the interviewer and the interviewee, that you need to capture that voice, then you need to worry about that. And then, of course, this uh, the shop, if you're... if there's a reason why it needs to be in this coffee shop. Maybe you're interviewing the uh, the owner of the coffee shop and it's video and they want to show the equipment behind them. So make sure that that equipment's not running while it's going on. Try and get close to the flat walls. Have them sit in a high back chair and then uh, uh, move furniture around to kind of reduce the audio <laughs> and, and stuff like that. But the whole point is that it, these are the factors that you need to uh, think about when it comes to this type of recording because then you can get it up high and close to the face if it's just audio. Good guy. 
Yeah, I was going to suggest the same. Change the environment if you can. If there's a nearby hotel or something like that where it's a little bit quieter, quieter than especially a room with less reflections, uh, you know, hard surfaces, things like that, clanging and banging around. Uh, and then a stand. If you can, uh, those have a quarter 20, I believe it is, uh, or three ace on the bottom. So you'll want to mount that thing and get it as close as you can to the subject to try and avoid any kind of uh, shakes or um, things that will translate through the body of that, that system. Also look for a coffee shop with little cubby holes. You know, a lot of times they have little areas that are a little bit more enclosed and then have you hear a lot less from the, the, the audience around. Zoom's got a lot of things that have XLR inputs. I would strongly think about two SM58s going into, into a Zoom uh, H2. You know, there's another H2 that Zoom makes that has two XLR inputs. Um, it's going to be infinitely better than what you're, what you're about to do. Uh, next question. Daniel Patridge from Rochester, Minnesota. Is Apple Compressor still worth purchasing? Reviews seem to indicate it is near abandoned by Apple and maybe not really being updated much for new processors, codecs, and OS versions. Go ahead, Bill. For me, the answer is OMG, yes. Uh, I use it every time I work on one of my audiobooks, particularly in the final mastering stage. It is a brilliant program because I have a watch folder set up. I take 50 chapters of the book, toss them in a folder, uh, maybe have a couple of sips of coffee. And when I look, there's another folder that has all of the correctly processed files collapsed into mono and ready to be distributed. It saves me probably six hours of work every time I do that process. So if you're looking for specific kinds of automated actions, compressor can be fabulous for that. Plus, it just ensures compatibility, having all of those translational things in there to translate uh, video or audio files from one codec to another. I use it all the time, and I find it to be a great program. Plus, at 49 bucks, it's just like a no-brainer. Mitchell? I wouldn't be too quick to count uh, Apple Compressor out this uh, at this stage. It just may appear that there's not much development being done on it. If you must try something else, uh, I, I think it's pretty much on the symbol par is Media Encoder, but that requires you to get involved with Adobe. Uh, Chris? Yeah, uh, I'll say this about a, a Compressor. First of all, it's super fast. Um, even my boss, Paul, who quite often uh, through the history of Compressor called it um, App Forbidden. Oh, don't use App Forbidden. That was his nickname for it. But it was because he just didn't understand the user interface. Compressor suffers from what some of the Apple Pro apps suffer from, and it's that progressive disclosure. I think we referred to it yesterday, where you first open it up and it's like, eh, it doesn't look like it does anything. It does plenty. It does, it does absolutely plenty. And uh, even Paul, my boss, recently had a bunch of like three-hour things, and he had to admit, he goes, oh my God, it's so much quicker than media encoder so much quicker it's so much faster <laughs> like it's it's so tuned to what the uh it is it's probably it's four times faster than media encoder. Isn't it? and i i find that there's a lot more dials that i have control over i mean you're right that it looks like it doesn't have a lot there is so much control inside of how you compress things and how you work how, how do you build them um, and i've been using it since version one but i've also used lots of other compression apps and this is by far the fastest on a mac so if you're on a mac Compressor is the way to make something bigger or smaller. <laughs> you know, like that is that is the key. One last thing. I, I did a job last year where I had to output, there was some confusion about five tracks versus five channels. I can't remember all the details, mm -hmm. but without Compressor, I couldn't have solved it. I mean, the, the file coming out of Final Cut was like, well, it was close. And I just had to click one more checkbox. And it was like, boop, boop. And it was exactly what they needed for a playback in the hall. Next question. Okay, uh, next question coming in from Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. I got an email from Google, <clears throat> pardon me, saying they're spinning off their podcast. Does anyone know more about this? Jeffrey, real quick. Yeah, uh, basically what's happening is they're merging it into YouTube music. They're trying to decentralize everything. And then, of course, uh, there's so many advantages to being into the YouTube infrastructure versus the Google podcast infrastructure. The biggest thing is the search engine. It's the number two search engine out there. So your podcast will be more searchable, more usable. And then, of course, with the premium membership, you'll be able to listen to the audio stuff while your phone's in your pocket. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, that, exactly what Jeffrey said. They're trying to move people. I think uh, YouTube Music wasn't getting enough subscribers, so they're trying to merge it into YouTube Music to drive more subscribers. And it says that they, in, in 2024, that the podcasters uh, will be able to upload their RSS feeds to YouTube. So then you'll be able to transition your audience over from the RSS feeds into YouTube Music. But I think you're going to have to pay for a subscription.
Next question. Chris Clark from Tempe, Arizona. My granddaughter is struggling in a college course on 3D modeling that users and teachers SolidWorks would help be available via After Hours. You know, I don't think there's a lot of users within our group that use SolidWorks. I'd look at LinkedIn Learning. I think that they have some SolidWorks um, uh, tutorials and they, they're they very well structured. So I'd, I'd highly recommend taking a look, but I don't think we have a ton of SolidWorks users within our group. If you are a SolidWorks user, ping us on in Discord and let us know. But right now, I'm not sure that that, that would be very available. Um, we have, uh, coming up next, we're going to be talking about equalization. Uh, Thursday, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about black magic design camera updates and how they might affect us. So there's a lot of things with between the bridge, the web presenter, uh, RTMP, SRT, um, you know, the um, remote control and rest. And we're going to talk about some of those things and why they're important and why we, that we need to keep on paying attention to them. Uh, we think it's going to be pretty important as we move forward and look at some of the things that we can do in the future. Now, Friday, we're going to talk, Viz RT will be here talking about the cloud and production in the cloud. So we're looking forward to having that team here on the, on the show. Uh, of course, Saturday and Sunday are both two hours of Q&A or up to two hours of Q&A. Remember that Saturday is a test day. Um, so we're testing HDR and HDR 10 5.1 4K into YouTube. So it may, you may see things change throughout the, <laughs> throughout the day or throughout the morning as we, as we're constantly tweaking that. We're going to be doing that all fall as we get ready to move the whole show to HDR 4K 5.1. So, um, so just stay tuned um, for, for that as we keep moving forward. Reminder that we've got a Squares TV uh, application lab at 10 a.m. Uh, uh, conversations with Tony Mobley behind the scenes uh, starting at 4 p.m. And tomorrow, uh, we won't have the Isadora Lab. That, that's going to be um, um, coming back next week. Let's go ahead and jump into the second hour. Welcome back to the second hour, and uh, and we're excited to have all of you. And we're going to be talking about equalization. It's really important. You can oftentimes take a relatively okay mic or okay record and make it much, much better by simply um, moving these. This is very much like the curves that we would have in, in Photoshop uh, to adjust our image and bring it, bring the full value out of it. Um, and I'm going to hand this off to Jeff, um, who's going to start the conversation and kind of walk us through uh, the basics of equalization. Go ahead and take it away, Jeff. So starting real basic, I like to uh, categorize in my mind uh, all the different audio effects. So we have all the different flavors of gain, making things louder and softer. And that comes in the preamp gain. Those are trims. Those are faders. That's gain. And that just changes the signal, makes it louder or softer, independent of the signal completely. Then we have the whole family of EQ equalization that we'll talk about today, which I consider to be frequency dependent gain. It changes gain, makes things louder and softer, but it does it not to the whole signal, but it does it to certain frequencies more than others. Uh, if you, we get to a day where we talk about dynamics processors, compressors, limiters, expanders, gates, all those sorts of things, those are level dependent gain. So they will make things louder and softer based on how loud the signal is going through there. So EQ is this uh, you know, frequency uh, dependent gain. So probably a good idea to think about some basic parts of this. And we basically have the question of how much gain? So that's gonna be a boost or a cut control. Um, where is it going to happen? And that depends on the type of filter. That's going to be a center frequency or a corner frequency. And then, you know, really how much is it doing? And that's a thing we talk about that's called bandwidth or Q. Now, uh, EQ filters break into three categories. Basic filters, these are our high-pass filters, low-pass filters. We'll talk about those. They are attenuation only. They do never boost. Uh, then we have shelving filters or shelf EQs. And then we have the, the classic sort of peak or bell EQ. Um, so filters, uh, high and low pass filters are kind of our most common ones. Uh, the low pass filter LPF, also people consider it a high uh, cut filter. This passes low frequencies, cuts high frequencies. And then we have the opposite of that, which is the high pass filter, which is a low cut filter. I know it's confusing. It depends on, on which term you like and which term people are using, but those two mean exactly the same thing. If it's passing highs, it's cutting lows. If it's cutting lows, it's passing highs. Um, and then 
with these filters, we're primarily concerned about with where the change happens. Where do we go from passing, not changing audio, to attenuation? And that's the the corner frequency or the cutoff frequency. And then how fast does that slope? So if we just look at a typical high pass filter here, uh, it's actually showing two of these. They both happen at 70 hertz. So this is going to pass frequencies above 70 hertz. And there's nothing in audio that is a complete black or white answer. Of, you know, we, we think about a brick wall filter, and we can talk about that later, but that's a pretty rare uh, instance of audio filter. So this is going to pass frequencies above 70 hertz. But even the 70 hertz, we're at that corner, which is 3 dB down, and we're, and, and we're sloping away. And for our listeners, can you explain why you would use a high pass filter? Uh, to get rid of uh, garbage, basically any low frequency information that's not not required. So my voice has a high pass filter on it right now, a low cut filter, because uh, my speaking voice doesn't have frequencies down at 30, 40, 50 hertz. So what's going to be down there is plosives, the sounds you get if I. Uh, you know, if you hold your hand in front of your face and you say a P syllable, Peter Piper picked, uh, you feel a blast of air. If that blast of air hits the mic and it's not well windscreen, uh, directing that air away from it, you will get a plosive that'll have a large uh, burst of low frequency energy. Uh, if I bump into the mic, um, if there is a low frequency ring on a stage from kick drums and bass and other things, all of that can be, can be filtered out and stopped uh, from going into the audio chain. So um, I consider the the high-pass filter sort of the unsung hero of the audio world. Um, it's, it's, it's really useful in just removing garbage. So filters tend to be uh, sort of corrective. They're going to take things out. Um, but it's also a matter of how, how steep that slope is. Um, so if you... Uh, Here I have, so I'm using pink noise because it's got all frequencies. If that needs to be louder, let me know. Um, but this is just a very simple uh, high pass filter we're looking at. So that's passing the highs above that. And then we get the ability to change um, the, the slope of this high pass filter. And you'll see the word slope and you'll see the word order, which is basically how steep, once it goes into the cut region, it doesn't cut it completely. It doesn't mute that audio. It reduces it as you get farther away from this corner frequency. So I'm gonna set this just at 200 Hertz and you hear it's cutting lows, but I can do that where it's cutting less steeply. And so you get a little bit of those lows because that's six decibels per octave. And you'll see that number appear because that's based on the way analog circuitry was built and now digital models of these are, are coded that basically you have the choice of 6 dB per octave, 12 dB per octave, 18, 24, all of those on up. And that's the steepness. Well, what's an octave below 200 Hertz is a doubling or having a frequency. So 100 Hertz is half 200 Hertz. That's an octave down. 100 hertz is being reduced by 6 or 12 or 18, depending on where I have that setting. And is there a, uh, we haven't really gotten into the, the graphic um, uh, equalizers yet, but is there an advantage to using a high pass filter over just doing it yourself in a graphic, doing it in some kind of curve? Uh, the thing about a high pass filter is it keeps on reducing as you go lower and lower. Um, whereas a peak EQ will have a center. So if we talk about a, a standard peak filter, sorry. So here are two standard peak filters. The peak is going to have a choice of a center frequency, the 
place where the most amount of uh, amplitude change is made. And you can choose that. And then you have a choice of how much you're boosting or cutting. That's a second knob. And then you have the width, which is bandwidth or Q. And so if you're using that filter to do the low frequency, eventually it will start to raise back up. So you may be reducing 40 hertz, but 20 hertz may not be reduced as much. Is that kind of what you're asking there? Yeah, no, yeah, just curious. I, I have to admit that um, for, for the most part, when I'm doing EQ, I, I take the two ends, I take the last two and I just pull them all the way. <laughs> I just pull them at the edge where the curve just goes down to negative 80. And then, I, and then I move them in and out to kind of create that sandwich. And then I do whatever else I'm going to do to it. Um, so I'm just curious if, it's, if I'm doing it the right way. <laughs> so. I mean, is there a right way to do EQ? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a good question. Yes, there is. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Robert, <laughs> do you just want to add anything there, Robert? I mean, you know, I, I mean, that kind of comes from some old school there where, you know, if somebody's taking a third octave equalizer per se and, you know, trying to create a high pass filter with it when in fact it's creating kind of this, you know, by doing right. that because all those center frequencies are brought down, but the end of, in, in between frequencies are, you know, remaining to some degree there. It's not a strict slope right there. So, right. you know, in terms of phase, it's not the, not the greatest idea to do it. So there you go. Good. Yeah. So what you're talking about is a, is a graphic EQ. A graphic EQ is many, 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 many bands of individual peak EQs that we just talked about. So you might have 30 of those bands. Um, each of those bell or peak EQs has those three parameters, um, which is where we get the name of a parametric EQ. We have a boost and, cut. And I we have, have a set of frequency. I, I probably just just as a note, I, I just want to I, that's not what I was. I think of my EQ. I don't. I just have a curve. Like I don't know how to use those little things. I haven't used those for twenty years, so I don't know what that that. When I say graphic EQ, I know that that that's what we used to have. But but I'm I'm talking about having a. You know, I don't know how I would, I, I now have to think about it. But when I think of EQ, I just think of what I have in Logic or, or um, you know, when I open up a... Yeah, it's funny because the we, we actually now have EQs that are actually graphic and show us displays. Right. Um, show us displays of the, of the audio. Um, but actually, before we had computers, we had that crazy thing with the sliders. And it was called a graphic EQ because the sliders actually represented what you were doing to the yeah. audio, at least closely. But as, as Robert was saying, uh, they, they don't actually give you the control you need. And, and so those have really, in my mind, have fallen out of, out of use. And we're, we're only using uh, filters, shelving filters, and peak EQs now, param parametric EQs, because you do have the control of all the three primary parameters in that peak EQ. Yeah, I, I actually think some of that was driven by the arrival of the computer where we got to see the actual response of something like on that third octave equalizer where we would put something in and think, okay, well, that's the EQ shape. But if you actually analyze the signal and looked at the actual EQ shape that was happening, it was like, uh oh, um, maybe we shouldn't be doing that, right? So, so second uh, sort of family of filters, well, so filters with the high and low pass, those are the common ones. Um, there are some, some stranger ones, which is uh, if you combine the two of those together, you get a band pass. Um, that's kind of what you were talking about, rolling those, those ends in. Uh, this is really common. Uh, if you want to make sort of a, <clears throat> a telephone EQ, you can roll off the lows and roll off the highs. If you kind of do the opposite of that, you can get a band stop or a notch filter. So a notch filter is going to try to remove one frequency very uh, with a large attenuation and not affect frequencies around that. Um, and then the second major time of, of filters is shelving filters. So shelving filters, uh, <clears throat> if you've used the bass treble control in your car stereo, you've used a shelving filter. So shelving filters make a little shelf and they only work at the extremes. So they work from some frequency to the extreme. So in this case, we have a shelving filter at, uh, 
what is that, 100 hertz? That goes from 100 hertz down to the low extreme. That's a low shelf. So everything from 20 hertz to 100 hertz is trying to be affected the same amount. And in a high shelf, everything from the frequency that the thing reads to the extreme of audio, 20 kilohertz, is affected in the same way. So you get a shelf uh, that's, that's, and these are generally used for, for tonal shaping. You know, it's, it's where we get our bass and treble controls. <clears throat> so they're going to broadly shape the, the sound of things. Um, so if we, we want to... Here I'm boosting lows or reducing lows. Same thing if I go to the highs. So those are just broad shaping controls. And then the peak EQ gives you the, the finer control of the ability to choose where the frequency is, how much it's boosting or cutting, and how wide that is. And for our, for our listeners, uh, you know, as you start to build kind of a notch, why would you build notches in your EQ? Uh, a particular notch EQ would be to remove some offending frequency. Um, and if it's a post-production, probably I would use a tool that's something like an Isotope RX that has a lot more finer control than going to a notch EQ. Because the problem with EQ... Every EQ under the sun is dealing with phase because that's how EQ works. Um, we do get linear phase EQs, but in order to do a linear phase EQ, you need lots of time. So they have a lot of latency in them. So normally EQs for production have a uh, phase shift in them. And that's a natural sound of EQ, and that's part of what we're dealing with. But as you get into stronger and stronger EQs, ones that are doing a large boost in a very narrow region or a large cut in a very narrow region, they have bigger phase shifts. And so you hear sonic anomalies with that. Jason. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add that there was talk about, um, you know, th this kind of modeling, someone, someone had asked about it, I think in the first hour. And so, you know, this kind of sonogram, and, and seeing this interactive, this is not affecting my mic, but what you're seeing is a model of my mic. Uh, it's pre-fader listen, so you know if I cut all of this, you wouldn't hear a difference in my speaking voice, but just for a graphic representation of, of what Jeff's talking about, this is basically it in real time, and this is just the X32 app. Did you have, did you have any more, uh, Jeff, before we uh, open up to questions? So this, uh, the, the last thing to probably think about is, um, is the bandwidth control because bandwidth or Q can be confusing to people. And that's basically looking at on, on this peak EQ is the, you know, we have the control over how much we boost or cut. I have the audio muted at the moment, so you don't have to listen to pink noise all day. We have control over what frequency. And then the last control is how wide or narrow, how selective or broad this EQ is. So one description of that is bandwidth. And bandwidth is just a range of frequencies. So it's a, it's a width of frequencies. And usually that's expressed in EQs in octaves. So Robert was talking earlier about graphic EQ being a third octave EQ because each of those peaks was a third of an octave wide. Um, the other term that is used for this is Q, which is a terrible term because Q stands for quality and it has nothing to do with how good or bad an EQ is. It simply has to do with um, 
how surgically precise or how broad that shape is. Um, narrow bandwidth is high Q. Low Q is broad bandwidth. So those are just, just that description. With the graphic display that we have on most devices, um, it, it's pretty easy to see this visually when before you have that, or if you have an EQ that's just knobs, you know, it's just turn the knob and listen, and you hear a broad cue is going to be much more obvious because it's changing many more frequencies. So... Here, that's just making a single little frequency ring out in the middle because it's a very narrow, very narrow cue. If I run the cue really low, this is going to sound loud because it is. It's taking a, a large chunk of the audio and turning it up 15 decibels. So it's going to sound a lot louder. If you put all three of those parameters together, that's considered one peak EQ or bell EQ. And then we combine lots of those together to make what we consider to be a parametric EQ because it has lots of parameters. The word I was grasping for later, earlier. <laughs> so this yeah. is a, a seven band parametric EQ. And you see that we get the ability to have high and low pass filters. And then we have many bands of peak and shelf. And it's very common for the extreme to be switchable doesn't make any sense to have a shelf in the middle because shelves always go to the end. There's high shelves and low shelves. So yeah, it's probably a good time to jump into questions. Well, and, and we had a couple, couple from the panelists. One, one thing before we jump into that is, so we've talked about theoretically how these all work. In practice, what, how do you approach the EQ process, I guess, is the, is the question. So uh, removing junk that's not important to that or is is extraneous to the signal is the job of filters and generally a high pass filter is a very common thing on instruments that don't require it um, general toning shape tonal shaping from uh, shelving filters boosting lows or, or highs and then uh, parametric EQs are allow you finer control and finer control doesn't necessarily mean narrow filters it could be broad filters, but allows you to narrow to align those to just the right frequency um, and also to give just the right amount of booster cut. Generally, it, it cutting is good practice. If there's stuff you don't want, we're cutting things out. Uh, and there's an adage, I think this was a, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name, but I'll get it in a moment. But uh, the, the boost to find cut to fix. So it's really common with uh, these, let me just zero this out. Really common to take a filter and put a fairly high Q on it. With a fairly high boost, sweep it to find the frequency you want and then we'll cut. So if we're looking for a problematic frequency, boosting with a narrow Q allows us to hone in directly on that frequency. And then we can reduce that. Good, Bill. Well, that's exactly what I was mentioning. Um, the Q for me has always been deviation. It's not so much quality. It's how far across from the center frequency that frequency is. And so every time I set up a mic in a new room, one of the first things I do is pull up a system so that I can narrow the Q, push it up really high, sweep it back and forth. And as soon as I hear something that sounds ringy or overemphasized, I will pull that down. And that process can make a room that normally sounds 
modestly bad for a microphone, you just get rid of some of the problems and it sounds a lot better after I go through that process. So that's all I was mentioning. Good, Mitchell. Yeah, great add-on, uh, a great demo and an add-on to what Bill just said. Uh, could you show us some examples of not doing it right? For example, notching out a particular frequency where you've gone too far with it and you get the ringing and comb filtering and weird stuff. I think that's a, a good example of uh, of what <laughs> think, people do wrong. I think in general, aggressive EQ is usually gets you into wrong really quickly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it depends on what it is, but I, I know that I, I think in my early days, I was much more aggressive about it. Now it's just usually a very kind of... Um, coaxing of, of well, those things. Nowadays, there are plugins that do that for you. But uh, back oh, in the I old don't. days, we had the we had the notch filters and things like that. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead Jason. Yeah. Um, for those of you who, who get confused with high pass, low pass, here's the way that I remember it. If you are nearsighted, you can see near. A low pass filter allows low to pass. Yeah. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, there's also the topic of pre-equalization, which we used to have equalization curves to compensate for the playback media that was going to be played back on. Um, so that you would have the Academy curve back when uh, films were on optical soundtracks, so that you would, while you're mixing, you would apply this curve that was fairly radical at rolling off the low end and the high end, so that you could hear what it would sound like when it plays back in the theater. There's also the RIAA curve for uh, vinyl records that was applied to compensate for the frequency inadequacies of the playback media. These days with digital record and playback, pretty much everything's flat from one end to the other. So we don't get into the pre-EQ curve and what you hear in recording is what you get when you play back. But uh, uh, yeah, maybe Jeff could talk some about uh, pre-equalization uh, and how it's used and why it's used. So you're talking about like pre-equalization, like the RIA and that kind of thing for, f right, for phonograph? RIA. Yeah. Because so going that case, back to vinyl, you know. <laughs> well, vinyl's still a thing, but in that, uh, that was a way, basically, the RIA curve was about cutting and uh, about reducing the surface noise. So in the, they were basically reverse curves, symmetrical reverse curves. So there was EQ put on the signal on its way to the cutter, which would boost highs and cut lows. And then on the way off the playback, everybody's home phonograph preamp would reduce highs and boost lows. And in doing that, the surface noise only, anything introduced by the disc only went through the de decode or the playback EQ, but the audio went through both. And so the audio hopefully arrived unchanged and we reduced the uh, no surface noise of the disc. And also uh, large low frequencies are harder to cut. So reducing them on the way of the disc made it easier to cut the disc. Some other uh, examples of what uh, Courtney's talking about is the preemphasis curve on broadcast FM and also DBX and Dolby both did the same thing to emphasize the frequencies of the uh, tape being recorded and then de-emphasize or deprocess at the end. Yep, right. except Dolby and DBX also did things with, uh, so they were a companding, so they did compression and expansion, not just EQ. So RIAA is just, just EQ. Um, so EQ in practice is a great tool but generally, if you're finding that you're using uh, so much EQ to try and fix it, that, that points to a bigger problem if you're having to use, you know, gobs of EQ. Um, it probably means wrong mic placement, bad sounding room. Um, and many of those things you can't fix with EQ because bad sounding room is echoes and, and time problems. And so the EQ may help but it's not often a thing that will fix that. So if there's too many echoes in my room talking to you, um, I can reduce the frequencies that are, are the resonant frequencies of my room based on standing waves, but it's not really going to reduce the reflections. It will just reduce those frequencies that are ringing a lot. So there's often times where EQ is easy to grab, but it's not always the right solution. Robert, did you want to add anything before we jump into questions? Yeah, I, I have a couple of uh, observations here. So 
uh, you know, given what Jeff was just talking about, you know, it's, and again, I'm going to kind of go back to this home studio revolution that happened where people inadvertently started to realize this, you know, where you talk about like boosting up frequencies to hear room resonance and things like that, and then cut it out, you know, really what you're actually doing there is applying the inverse response of the room to the voice, right? You're, you're taking the room equalization and essentially applying it to the voice there, which is not necessarily what you would want. And what that really says in the end of the day is you need a better sounding room. All right, we're going to use the equalizer as a Band-Aid right now to make this room sound less echoey and my voice sound another way. But, you you know, that's that's kind of misapplying the piece, right? It's kind of misapplying the equalizer when you do things like that. So it, this whole talk of pre-emphasis and de-emphasis as well also kind of belies the fact that equalization is situational, right? We need to apply EQ during different situations. I, I The best example I can come up with is, you know, like when we're recording music, if we're recording analog, I have a completely different approach to equalization to tape than I would in digital. They're very different approaches. If I was recording exactly the same instrument to analog versus recording it to digital, two different approaches because of how those machines are going to handle it on playback, right? So, you know, I, it, you can get in really into the weeds with this if you're not careful here, but, uh, you know, situational, it's definitely that. Well, and don't you have situations where you're not just using EQ to make something better, but you're using EQ to um, to grab onto something you might like, for instance, that low pass filter might be most of the signal, <laughs> like, you know, that you're, you're using that signal for something else, right? Yeah. And I think it's that's how it's easy to overuse things at times as well. I, I mean, I kind of break equalization, especially if I'm working in music and especially in live sound into kind of two categories. I, I I consider one kind of surgical where I'm trying to actually repair a signal a little bit. And then I'll go back to something more broadband to do tone shaping, something that is going to make it fit within the piece of music. Because, you know, that's, I don't want to call it a crime. That's too strong. But it's one of the things that, you know, when I'm talking with young engineers, et cetera, that they have a tendency to want to do is listen to something in solo, make it sound the way I want and then try to build music out of it, you know? And you just, you just run into the situation, it's kind of the mystery of it, where how come that sounds so good when I listen to it on its own, but in relationship to the other instruments and stuff, it, it doesn't sound like that anymore. It doesn't read like that anymore. And it, you know, that all has to do with frequency masking and frequency layering within the complexities of a mix, right? So like I said, you get into the weeds really, really quickly with equalization. So you gotta be, gotta be careful with it. Absolutely, Jeff. Yes, same kind of thing. There's there's fixing EQ and then there's color shaping EQ. And um, it very much depends on whether you're doing spoken word or whether you're doing pop music and whether you're doing live. Um, so like a mic in a kick drum, it's a really common thing in pop music to put a mic in a kick drum. That's not a natural place where we listen. And so the sound of the kick drum for for pop rock music is not a natural thing. Um, but where that mic picks up, first of all, we're not talking about mic placement today, but very small moves that close or inside a source, very small moves change the, the frequency response and tonality of that. And so then EQ can be used to highlight things that, that we like. So in, in the kick drum, the low thump and maybe the sharp, higher frequency attack and it can be used to reduce things we don't like. Uh, the low mid uh, that I think makes a kick drum sound like you're hitting a cardboard box. If we remove, reduce, filter out those, those frequencies from a kick drum, uh, it sounds much more like we would expect and works better in a mix because we have the low thump, we have the attack, and we don't have this sort of garbagey, low mid region that's going to fight with all the other harmonic instruments in the mix. Like Robert was saying about might sound okay as on its own, but it has to fit with other instruments. Good, good Bill. Yeah. Jeff. I just wanted to note that when I was talking about doing that, I usually use that when I'm setting up a mic to do voiceover in a room that I'm not used to. It is a band aid. Now, sometimes you have a cut and a Band-Aid's the right tool, but it doesn't, you know, I, I used it here the first week I was in this particular setup, but then I started hanging drapes like behind me and I treated the room and eventually I didn't need those Band-Aid's that I had been using before. So 
a appropriate use when it's necessary. You were going to say something, yeah. Robert? I was just going to say to, to Bill, too, just keep in mind, we do that very thing every single day in live sound because we yeah. can't treat that room. <laughs> so, right. Exactly. You know, we, yeah. we have to do that there. So. Every walkthrough, you'll, every, every time I walk through a new space that we're going to do an event in, you'll hear me go, and I'm just listening for how that set, how that I, I can, I know what that should sound like, you know, and I know how, how, but I can, you know, you get used to knowing what that's going to be like, but you'll hear me clicking all the time while I'm walking through it. It seems like a minor thing, but it, it's me figuring out like how much work are we going to need to do with this space to, to make it either usable or to, to manage that process. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. To what Jeff was saying, Jeff, I find that kick drums are, are, are really fascinating. I've, I've mixed a lot of live music with a lot of bad bands and a lot of bad drummers with bad kits. And I, and I always felt like, you know, kick drums sound like a pizza box. And then I was walking through a music store once and I heard somebody playing a great kit and it had this just amazing kick drum. And I was like, oh, that's what it's supposed to sound like. And it absolutely changed my mic positioning, the way I would gate things and EQ. And I find that there's kick drums make three sounds. There's the, the first sound is the of the pedal. And then there's that hit. And then there's the resonance. And I think the thing that people love the most in like a big show is that resonance, even probably more so than the punch of the kit of the actual mallet hitting. And it absolutely changes the way that you mix things, in my opinion. It really is interesting. I mean, this is a little bit of a divergence, but it, it, it always, it reminds me when you're talking about that is, is I was once talking to Ben Bird about recording gun sounds. You know, they, Ben Bird is a, has a couple of Academy Awards for doing this kind of thing. And he said, the problem is everyone points the mic at the gun and he goes, you got to point it away. It's, it's, what, it's how the environment reacts to the gun. So, you know, he goes, I have this one place in California that has just enough grass to go and just enough trees to go and just enough rocks to go you know, and 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 uh, and, he, and, he, and he goes, and you fire it off into there, and you get a great gun sound. And I was like, where is that place? He's like, I can't tell you that. Right, go ahead, Mitchell. I was just going to say the exact same thing, is that uh, what we're used to hearing uh, for a certain objects is not necessarily how they actually sound. Because a typical gun is like, <laughs> instead of, <laughs> you know, with the reverb and echo and the well, environment, like Alex was just talking about. And we've had we've had uh, Foley artists show us that you know the, the, what you're listening to and what's actually happening to make it more real. Celery is much more real than than bones. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say my observation is that clearly none of the panelists are listening to enough hip hop music, given the kick drums that you're describing here. <laughs> <laughs> Because they Jeff. are the yeah. antithesis Not everything of is what you away. just described as a kick drum. There, you know, I mean, they are the anti. Steely Dan kick drum. They are the boxy kick drum all over the place. I just came yeah. off of mixing the iHeart Radio Festival for two days and I, I heard my share of it, believe me. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Jumping to a completely different genre, um, I've do, done a lot of classical music recording and uh, it's amazing how these musicians know the sound of their instrument. And so if you capture them with a really flat microphone, they love that. And then, boy, you put a just a touch of EQ on that. And they're like, no, nope, nope, that's not me. <laughs> you know, they, they hear the slight change in timbre to their instrument. Um, and, and if you use a mic, you know, let's remember, mic, not every mic is flat. So if you use a mic that has a slight high frequency boost, that's immediately they're like, no, that doesn't sound right. Um, so it's, it's, it goes well before EQ. It goes well before microphones and mic placement. It goes all the way back to the instrument you know what did chris say about the kick drum he liked the kick drum that he heard in the store because probably that kick drum was treated properly dampened tuned all of those sorts of things so and it goes to the room i mean the your gun example alex is really that's the room yeah. ben burt is finding the room where guns sound right yeah or absolutely. appropriate for what he wants no, absolutely. And, and I, I always go back to, to me, the room is no matter what I'm doing, whether it's a, a zoom, uh, you know, someone coming into the, you know, into a zoom session or, or, or someone I'm, I'm paying more attention typically to the, to the room than almost anything else, because that's the thing that, that kind of boxes you into a corner or, or not. Go ahead, Chris. There's a great scene in the documentary, Hell, Hell, Rock and Roll, where Chuck Berry is getting in a fight with the, with the film crew, because somebody's trying to turn his amp down for the filming because it's too loud in the room and he's like and he goes off on the guy it's it's <laughs> it's actually it's the guy from uh 
the Rolling Stones, who was the musical director. I can't remember his name, the guitar player. Sorry, it's I apologize. Keith. It's Keith. Keith. Yeah. Yeah. It's and a fantastic You know the scene? scene? It's a great scene. And and you know, Chuck got Chuck got abused in the early part of his career. And this is about Chuck defending himself and the way he changed his his music, his approach to the music industry, and how he brought everything in-house, as in Chuck will do it himself. You know, Chuck gets on the plane himself. Chuck carries a guitar himself. He rents his own car. No, you're not going to buy me an overpriced limo. I'll show up. You pay me cash. I'll take the money. I'll go out on stage. It's a great documentary if you haven't seen yeah, Hail, and, Hell, Rock and, and Roll. I'm, I'm sorry, but Chuck was right in that. Yeah, film. Chuck was totally right. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. It's a great, it's a great film. It's absolutely worth watching. Let's go to the questions. Dave Kaufman from Vancouver, British Columbia. I saw an app that helps train you on what various frequencies sound like. Is this a useful skill? I hear A1 say things like cut 3 dB at 4 kil kilohertz. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I think probably it's a useful skill, but I don't know that I would do it in an app that trains you on frequencies. I would do it with music and playing with an EQ. Uh, do you need to know exactly how many dB and, and the frequency? No, we, we turn the knobs till it sounds good. Um, and one of the things we need to do is to not use our eyeballs. Um, and every Mac I have, the very first thing I do is I set up the bottom left-hand corner as a hot corner for the screensaver so that as I am editing, as I'm mixing and listening, and when I hit play, I roll the mouse in the bottom left-hand corner and my screen goes away, both for me and for people that are sitting with me, musicians, producers, so that they can stop looking at the screen and actually listen to things. So play with an EQ on music. Don't use app. Good, Robert. Whoop, can't hear you, Robert. Sorry, I'm going to be a little bit of the uh, counterpoint to that because I use one of these apps. And I think they're fantastic, um, but you have to get it in a, you have to listen to it in a good environment. Now that said, uh, I think, you know, Jeff is also right that being able to see equalization curve is way, way overrated. And I think it does, it, it damages us to a degree because we have a tendency to lean toward EQ curves that look good as opposed to ones that actually sound good. Uh, and, you know, we never had them before we had digital. So I, I'm I'm in agreement with him, and I do exactly the same thing. In my lower right corner is my screensaver, and if I'm EQing uh, on a DAW or something here in the studio or in the office, I just turn it off. I, you know, your attention is it's almost like you need to take away that sense. Uh, yeah, you need to be blind for a few minutes and just listen and make those changes. But in terms of training, purely training, I, I think those apps work really good in terms of training. Uh, you know, frequency and especially dynamics is really good at training dynamics. But uh, I'll just add one last thing to it. I think what is actually more important to some degree is to understand the frequency response of any instrument that you're trying to equalize, right? So, you know, you, I, you gave the example of, a you know, an orchestration, but it applies to electric guitars, voice, everything. And there's some great charts actually on the internet uh, about talking about the, you know, the usable, workable frequency range of any given instrument. N know that before you start and you'll, you'll have a really good, a good result. Do you use spectrograms or spectrographs at all while you're working? I do, especially live. I mean, you know, it's kind of a vicious environment there where there's, you know, typically you, you're not able to, uh, you know, get to things, you know, independently or singly to, to work on them. So you need to see how the overall response of a given input is impacting the entire thing. So, yeah, I rely heavily on analysis in the live world for sure. Yeah, I know oftentimes I'm managing many rooms at one time, you know, what we're doing, you know, for conferences and so on and so forth. And I have all of that up on, on the screen and I can just look over and see that there's a, there's a mic, there's a mic, but you know, we, we have a ground loop over here or there's something over here that I have to look at, or we have to do something because I don't, you know, I don't, I can't listen to all of them at the same time. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Also, besides learning frequencies, this is a little off the subject of EQ, but I've found it's really helpful to learn wavelengths of audio um, so that you begin to relate physical size of spaces. Um, I've actually got a chart somewhere that I built that has a lot of these things. But uh, the lowest frequency of audio is essentially the size of a 
semi tractor trailer, right around that kind of range. And then typical eight foot ceiling is around 125 Hertz. Uh, a piece of paper eight and a half by 11 is in the 1.3 to 1.6 range. The, the threads on a mic stand, the five eighths inch threads are the size of 20 kilohertz, the highest thing we can hear. So like having that just gives you a little bit more understanding of the First of all, we have 10 octaves of hearing. So, and when that gets out in physical spaces, it really matters. So having some basic rules of thumb of where those are, uh, you know, and how big those waves are, yeah, I find it be helpful. Next question. Next one in from Nigel DeSalle in Austin, Texas. EQ3 looks like a great tool, but it's part of Avid. For those on Macs, are there free or cheaper tools we can play with? Maybe Audio Hijack. Go, Jeff. Uh, I thought it might be a good idea to at least take a quick look at the EQ that's in the Fairlight. This is the, the ATEM Mini Fairlight EQ. Um, so this is a six-band parametric EQ. Um, you see that the end bands are... Uh, high pass and low pass filters um, with a variable frequency, but not a variable slope. I know the low, the high pass, low cut filter is a 12 dB per octave, um, which is sort of in between a general shaping and an actual surgical tool. Um, and then that low band can change to be a shelf, or you can for some reason, make it a high shelf down at the very low end. So each of those two bands have the ability to be a high pass, low pass, or a high shelf, low shelf. And then the middle bands have the ability to be peak, notch, or shelving. And it's kind of strange that we could, we could have multiple shelves going on here, but it'd be typical for this to be a high pass filter, and then this to be a low shelf, and then these to be peak EQs. But I could also change that to be a particular notch filter if we wanted. Um, so standard controls in here, um, you notice that when it's a peak EQ, we have the standard controls of frequency where it is, how much I'm boosting or cutting, that's the gain, and then the Q factor, how narrow or wide that is. Oh, sorry. I, just, I have um, next question. <laughs> sorry. Next question is, sorry, I got messed up there. There we go. Uh, from... Um, Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, is the basic goal of PAEQ to flatten out a room's sound amplification, or is it to shape the tone of a room? Want me to go on that one? Yeah, go ahead and jump in there. Um, uh, it can be both, uh, but I use them. I use two separate equalizers to do that. So, uh, in terms of just doing room equalization, it Really what you're doing, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is de-equalizing that room a little bit. You're looking for resonance or looking to rebalance the response of that room with equalization. It, it, honestly, it's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is with room treatment. But when we come in on a day-to-day -day into these rooms, the only tool we have is equalization. So we want to kind of de-energize those rooms You know, in the low mids, the low frequencies, high frequencies, whatever is doing that. And then... If you want to tone shape your mix coming out of the console, I, I typically use a different equalizer, equalizer for that. I'll use, a, use something very accurate with lots of bands possible uh, for the room de-equalization. And then I'll use a broadband EQ to tone shape uh, coming off the console for the mix coming off the console. Something like a Pultec MEQ1 or something like that. So, Next question. Dave Kaufman from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. A lot of interfaces I see have an air setting that they say emulate analog consoles. What is air? Go, ahead, Jeff. Air is uh, extreme high frequencies. Part of this has to do with um, 
the way digital is band limited. So if you're running at 48 kilohertz, you only have the possible frequencies up to 24 kilohertz. Um, and analog EQ can run to, to, you know, an analog console can pass 100K, no problem, uh, if you want it to, analog electronics. So when building uh, peak EQs, if you're going to center that peak EQ on 24 kilohertz, you know, it's a bell curve and the bell curve goes up and peaks at 24. What happens above that um, and, and the coding of doing that? If you, a great way to do this is to, um, is to actually upsample and that allows you to freely build this uh, peak EQ up at a really high frequency and have its full bell curve appear there because now you've extended your Nyquist frame rate, your Nyquist rate all the way up to 48 kilohertz, and then you need to downsample. So uh, there is a, sometimes where plugins will do that. Um, but yeah, it's it's looking at, at, it's a different shape of EQ that carries all the way up to really high frequencies, as I understand it. Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, do some people use it as a magical marketing term? Because uh, on some devices, it inserts a uh, transformer to add its own little special goodness to the audio. A lot of marketing. Next question. Next question from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. What is meant by British EQ on certain mixers, and why might I want it? Jason. Uh, the, the term that I'm familiar with for British EQ is called Perkins EQ. And what Perkins EQ does is it has, it has a, a a parametric spline and you can you can push or expand the um the perkins eq and then you know plus or minus and generally it's used i think on mackie consoles to this day for a um for a low mid or mid high push next question douglas carmichael asking would the uh optical low pass filter on a camera take an analogous role to the low pass filter in audio Kind of. I mean, it is, it is a low pass filter. <laughs> so, um, or, or high, it, it is a, um, you know, so this is uh, really the, the optical low pass filter um, that's there is really designed to get rid of Murray um, and other things that, that may occur inside of a camera. Without that, you may get these high frequencies. So it's really a, around um, you know, LEDs and other high frequencies. You'll start to see Murray and, and other things going on in that high pass or that low pass filter will oftentimes filter some of that out. Um, next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Should different EQ settings be used for near-field monitoring? Is the goal for a near-field monitor space to be as dead as possible? Go ahead, Jeff. So if you're talking about EQ settings for the elements of your mix, no, because your mix needs to translate to everything, so it's going to be one mix. Um, if you're talking about different EQ settings on the monitor chain itself, perhaps you can do some correction on that. Should near field be as dead as possible? No, nobody wants to live in a room that's as dead as possible. Uh, anechoic chambers are very uncomfortable. Go ahead, Robert. The audio guy can't get the mute button working. <laughs> <laughs> the more you're on the show, would, the faster you'll go to a hardware yeah, mute. <laughs> right. uh, I would just add to it, uh, if you're truly in the near field with your near, near field monitors, I would strongly encourage you not to equalize them. Okay. So, you know, that's the whole purpose for getting them in the near field to begin with, where you're hearing more direct sound from the near field monitor than you are from your room, your, your room reflection. Now that said, low frequency in any kind of untreated room is always the problem. So uh, if you want to try to equalize or if your monitors are sounding boomy, then try to find some corner treatments or some low cost corner treatments or some kind of uh, treatment on your walls that will, you know, are aimed below 200 Hertz, you know, below three, two or 300 Hertz. If you can do that, that'll get a lot better. But I would encourage you not to equalize your near fields because the response of what you print is going to be the inverse of that equalization. So if you make your monitors really dull, your print is going to be really bright. So that's kind of how it works there. Jeff. Uh, a year or so ago, I set up monitors in this room and uh, tweaked them and then eventually purchased some uh, room treatment. And as soon as I hung the room treatment, immediately I could tell my center was slightly off. 
because one of the monitors gain was slightly off from the other one. And that's something I had not noticed working in there until I'd killed this sidewall reflection. And then it was immediate. So it, it immediately I was like, wow, that was great money that I spent treating the room because it just clarified so much of what I was listening to. And one of the things that we have to deal with, I, or I have to deal with in my day-to-day -day work is the size of the room as well. So for, for most of what I'm dealing with, the room needs to be, to, to listen to it, to understand what's actually happening, needs to be about 40, 50 feet long and about 35 feet wide. And, um, and so the issue that we get into is that the energy is so different from near, near field and a theater environment that you have to hear it in the theater because things that sound very full and very rich in a near field environment will sound very stark and, and, and sterile in a, in a large theater. And so you really do have to think about the medium that you're delivering to as you, as you start to put these things together as well. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael, what does the panel think about AI-assisted plugins like Neutron that purport to solve problems like frequency masking automatically? I have not had a great success with Neutron. I have it um, and I've played with it and I found that I'd rather just go back to the manual tools <laughs> and, and, and do, the, do it myself or, or put them on piece by piece of certain kinds of filters. But um, I haven't, um, there's a variety of automatic tools that I think, I think if you're just getting started and you just need to get something out, um, I think that they're okay. Uh, but I think it's much better to learn how to how to do it yourself. You know, you can have a you can use a Cuisinart, but it is good to have nice knife skills <laughs> and then be able to do that yourself. And so I, I think of it that way. Um, next question: Why is live end dead end monitoring in a studio necessary? Jeff. So live end dead end is the idea that the front of uh, a studio where your monitor speakers are is generally absorptive and the rear is more reflective or diffuse. Uh, the idea is to cut down on early reflections. So where your speakers are, the speakers get to you first, but they also bounce off of sidewalls and ceilings and floor and the front wall. And so that those walls are treated to prevent those reflections. And then in the rear of the room, sound bounces back there and it hits uh, things that will cause it to diffuse, reflect off in many directions so that you do not have a completely dead environment. Um, going to immersive surround, Atmos monitoring kind of throws some of this out the window because now you have speakers behind you that are throwing sound uh, and they're going to have problems with reflections. So we probably need to still keep, because that's our primary feed is, is our stereo front, keep the dead end up there, but also make sure that we're not getting strange reflections from other speakers. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. What is loudness compensation's relationship to EQ? Jeff. So uh, the human ear does not hear frequencies equally. Uh, this is Fletcher Munson, Robinson Dadson, ISO loudness curves. Um, so at low levels, we're really good at hearing, you know, 1K to 3K to 5K. Uh, you know, that 3K to 5K is our most sensitive region, and we're terrible at hearing 30 hertz. And uh, that gets a little more even as we get really loud, which is why everyone likes to listen to music loud. Um, and so playback systems, home receivers used to have a thing called loudness compensation, a loudness button that when you turn the volume down, it would boost low frequencies so that your music sounded full, even though it wasn't loud. So it is an EQ. It is an EQ that gets removed as you turn the volume up. Next question. Next one in from Dave Kaufman in Vancouver, British Columbia. Final mixes, Slate VSX headphones are great monitors. Robert? Both is the answer. Um, you know, when I'm judging final mixes, uh, I, regardless of what control room I'm mixing in or where I'm at, I'm always referencing a pair of headphones that I know very, very well, uh, just to kind of, because I, I invariably hear things on headphones that I don't hear in the listening environment. So the answer for me is both. I have to have them both. Next question. Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida. When to use an EQ high or low shelf versus a high or low pass? Go ahead, Jeff. Generally, high, low pass is corrective, removing things you don't want, and then the shelf is a tone shaping. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, what does it uh, panel think of the response compensation plugins like Sonarworks or headphone room simulators like Waves NX? 
I can tell you, we've experimented with a lot of them in what I'm doing, and they have not been successful. <laughs> so, so they, you know, they, they, it just isn't. It, it is. Uh, they just haven't given us what we, uh, what we needed to truly simulate what we. What it, nothing replaces having the space that you're going to do it in, and we just haven't found that the simulators have been effective at, at giving us what we needed to do something at a professional level. I mean, I think it's fine if you're trying to get close or you're trying to get a sense of it, um, but you're still gonna have to get into that space to, to know what it's actually gonna, you know, the, the map is not the territory. You know, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, they don't have, as Robert was saying, when he goes into a venue, he only has certain tools and the tools he has are not the ones he would want to use. Sonarworks doesn't have the ability to hang sound absorption on the wall where it's needed. It only has the ability to affect frequency or time. So it has to use those tools, even if they're not the ideal tools. And, you know, it's also oftentimes the, the behavior of the whole room, ben, depending on who's there, what's there, how it's built, what, you know, all those things are so different from what you, what is actually in those simulators. You know, it's, it's really hard. Next question. I'm so glad I got a chance to ask this question. What's your favorite Spinal Tap reference? <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. So many, but mine's probably, it's a fine line between clever and stupid. <laughs> Go ahead, Robert. Mine would be, it's supposed to say Spinal Tap and Puppet Show. <laughs> <laughs> told them once, I told them a thousand times, it's Spinal Tap, then Puppet Show. <laughs> but this goes to 11. There, there we go. A no, funny story, I was almost in that movie. I was, How? Was How are you almost close. in that movie? Okay, so I'll, I'll tell this story. It's, yeah. I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version. Mm -hmm. So in the early 80s, I was working with a company in Los Angeles called Electrotech, mm -hmm. previously TFA Electrosound, right? Yeah. So I was working in the shop, and I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but almost all of that concert footage was shot at high schools around the valley. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> so the guys that were accruing in the shop, they were having to go out and do PA for these these events at these high schools and they were coming back going man i don't know what we're working on it's some stupid movie you know i mean it's like you go out it's just horrible you know blah blah i mean they were just going on and on about it yeah and i was thinking wow maybe i should go out and do it once so i didn't go but these guys kept going and then i go to see the movie you know however many years later i'm like oh my god there's brian oh, yeah. there's you know <laughs> they're all like, in there they're all over the place like one of the guys <laughs> that repels in it, it was like he was the guy from the shop i was like oh my gosh i could have been in spinal tap <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, you always. I've I've learned to always try to say yes to many of those things just because you just you just don't know. You just you don't just know. don't know. That's right, yeah. man. Absolutely. Thanks so much to the uh, to the panelists. We can't do this without you. And and welcome to uh, Robert. This is I think your first as a panelist. Uh, we had you as a guest, but it's really really great to have you here. Hopefully, we'll get you back. Uh, I'm going to practice on the mute button between now and the next time I'm back. I promise. So. That's per no, no. It's all good. It's 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 uh, it's it's hard. We, we're doing it so often. Uh, it's 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 very different. And and thanks to Jeff for all the preparation and, and building this out. Um, it was a great great session. So really well done. Um, thanks to the uh, to everyone, the producers out there, um, all ask, asking the questions and keeping our conversation going. And thanks to the incredible team on the back end that's managing this, developing the pipeline that makes this show actually work and actually cutting the show and putting it together. We really appreciate everybody's contribution. Tlaloc Traversal today, we uh, traveled uh, 58,000 miles. That's 94,000 kilometers. And that is 465 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. There we go. That's good. It was recorded in Dublin. I can't even say Perkins EQ without sounding like this. <laughs> it sounds too brittle. Too brittle. You can't Jeff, have great presentation today. <laughs> yeah, good. There's a lot of people who are going to learn a lot from this who didn't know the basics. Doubly was number two of my references. That was that was going to be good. my next one. My favorite is you can't actually dust for vomit. <laughs> <laughs> Talking All about right. the drummers, <laughs> so many good ones. All right, we're not here again. I, you know, I, I went to see. It. I, I went to see that movie in a theater when it released. Yeah. And I was living in Kansas City at the time, and 